في جنة عالية. This is all of this. These faces lit up, and this relaxation, and this happiness. Now the camera turns. Like, why are these faces so happy? Let's give you a view. What is it that they're looking at? They are in a garden that is completely covered in greenery that is high, aliyah. It is at a very high place. You know, Allah says in this dunya, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتٍ نَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ مَنْ نَشَاءٍ We raise the ranks of whoever we want. Literally, we are raised in Jannah into a high garden. Now, what's the benefit of a high garden versus a low garden? A high garden has a better view. So we've already been kind of being given a picture of why is it that you're gonna, your face is going to be so lit up. You're just going to be like, whoa, this is nice. Everywhere you see, you see a scape, an entire landscape, a heavenly scape. And, you know, everything that Allah has given to you is in your view, you know. So this is, فِي جَنَّةٍ عَالِيَةٍ لَا تَسْمَعُ فِيهَا لَاغِيَةٍ these fa- the tasma'u in Arabic could be two things. It could be anta tasma'u or it could be hiya tasma'u. The, the, both pronouns go back to tasma'u, which means there are two interpretations. One interpretation is for the Prophet himself directly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You, ya Rasulullah, will have, will have to hear no nonsense when you go there. La hiya, speech that has no benefit. As if the Prophet is being told, right now you get to hear a lot of nonsense. People say a lot of terrible things to you when you preach this message to them, when you recite this Qur'an to them. A time will come where your joy will be, there's never going to be any nonsense you ever have to hear again. That's almost like an alleviation to the Prophet ﷺ, and by extension all of us. Because we have to hear a lot of terrible things about Islam now. None of that will have to be the case then. But the other meaning of it is those faces. لا تسمعوا could, the ta could refer to wuju. يعني لا تسمعوا الوجوه فيها لا غيا. That those faces are not going to hear any nonsense, any uh, any uh, pointless speech, any any non-beneficial speech. Now this kind of gets some people worried. I'm all the way in Jannah. I want to have some useless conversations. <laughs> I want to just finally do bakwas and get away with it. And that's that's really what I want to do. So let's first understand lahu. Al-kalam al-ladhi la fa'idata lahu. Speech that has no possible benefit whatsoever. Wa hadha tanbihun ala anna al-jannah daru jiddin wa haqiqatin fala kalama fiha illa al-fa'idah. This, this could be an indication that the, the jannah is not about imaginary things. It's about things that are real and nothing that has no benefit will, will have a place there. Li anna al-nufus fiha takhallasat min al-naqaisi kulliha fala yaladhu laha illa al-haqaiqu wa al-sumu wa al-aqliyu wa al-khuluqi wa la yantiquna illa ma yaz he argues actually that at that time all of our impurities will be removed. So the things we're going to talk about are only going to be elevated higher things. I would also share with you that what is it that people waste their time talking about? Things they find entertaining, things that they find you know a uh, uh, pleasure in, things like that, right? So what's going to happen in Jannah is all the things that you are drawn towards. First of all, anything that was tempting or attractive or preoccupied you in this life a much better version of it is already in Jannah. And the, the version of it in Jannah always has benefit for you. The version of it in dunya looks like it may be beneficial to you, but once you ex- actually experience it, its benefit disappears and its harms show up. Right? It's, it's like a bait and switch in this life. But in, in Jannah, everything, even our pleasures have benefit to them. Even our temptations have benefit to them. Even our greeds have benefit. Everything is of the benefit to, to, to human beings and there's nothing that will be at the harm of anyone else. You know, like we learn in sociology 101 that, you know, a human beings can't get whatever they want. If I got whatever I want, that means I would have to rob you of something. That's literally what that means. If I want to, if I don't want to stop at any light, I just want to go home. I don't want to stop at any light. I will be hurting somebody else to do that. So we have to hold ourselves back from getting what we want. And we have to constantly compromise so we only get some of what we want and that's why we have laws, regulations and because otherwise we just trample upon each other's rights. It'll be chaos, right? Now, what is Jannah? In Jannah, to get what you want, you're not actually taking it from anybody else. It's actually infinitely yours. And you are not usurping anybody else's rights. There's no greed left. There's no jealousy left. There's no eye for somebody else's property left. Nothing, nothing like that left. All of it actually belongs to you, just like the other member of Jannah, all of it belongs to them. So, you know, نَزَعْنَا مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ غِلٍ We will remove any ill feeling they had towards each other, all of it will be gone. That's the beauty of Jannah. So that's why there is no lahu. There is no, there's no empty or vain speech. فِيهَا عَيْنٌ جَارِيَةٌ In it, there's also a wellspring. Now we saw a wellspring before. 
that was boiling and scorching. Now he says it couldn't be flowing any more beautifully. You're sitting by a wellspring and it's, and it's flowing. And by the way, the idea of flowing is that it's fresh, right? The Arabs would be desperate to find a water reservoir. And when they'd find it, if they found a well and it's got, you know, stale water in it, that would be death. Like fiha and harum bin ma'in ghayri asin. They'll find rivers, you know, that have water that doesn't go stale. So the idea of freshness is mentioned here. And so you can imagine you go to a wellspring and you're splashing your face and you're, you know, enjoying it. Fiha sururum marfu'atun. In it, they're going to find couches and beds that have been elevated. Elevated to suggest once again, to be able to view the entire company. Also, the Arabs didn't have much surur that were marfu'ah. They didn't have bedding or couches that were very elevated. You know why? Because a lot of times they were on the move. So they have to pack their stuff and go. They can't get a couch from like, you know, from a furniture store and then pack that on the camel and they, they can't do that. They have to have just basic couch, basic comforter or basic kind of a cushion and they just pick it up and go. But now you get to have the proper furniture. Sururu marfu'a. It's elevated. وَلَمَّا كَانَ الْإِرْتِفَاعُ عَنِ الْأَرْضِ مَأْخُوذًا فِي مَفْهُومِ السُّرُرِ Even though the idea of bedding already means elevated. وَكَانَ أَصْفُهَا بِمَرْفُوعَةٍ لِتَصْوِيرِ حُسْنِهَا It's to elevate, to, to show you how beautiful and how luxurious it's going to be. By the way, the idea of a raised seating in ancient times is associated with a throne. Like you're being treated like royalty when you get like an elevated seating. Nowadays they do that, right? They When, when somebody is getting married or something, they put them on a stage and then a funky looking chair on the stage and make them sit there, right? Because they're on display. And also they get, they get the, or the king in the ancient times gets the entire view of his court and everybody else. And so the, the, the elevated seating suggests kind of a royal treatment. And then that royal treatment is then furthered by what akwabu maldu'a. They're going to have cups. Uh, kub actually means expensive cup, like goblet. Back in the day, like golden or silver cups and, you know, really expensive ornamented cups and things that are placed already. Maudu'a. That suggests that you're sitting on your couch and you're like, ah, oh, I want to drink something. You don't have to get up. The drink's already been placed there. Other places in Quran will fill in this picture that not only is the cup already placed there, the servant comes running and he pours it in for you. You know, by the way, when you go to like, uh, I don't know, when you go to a burger place to eat food, Okay, you have styrofoam cups that come out of that pull thingy and then you go and you fill in with, you know, poisonous soda or whatever and you sit in your table and you throw the trash away yourself, self-service. When you go to an expensive banquet hall for a wedding, like some really rich family invited you to a wedding and it's like this expensive banquet hall, the tables are, there's tablecloth, there's napkin and you'll notice every time there's glasses upside down already there. Right? And then the guy that dresses like a penguin comes and says, Hey, sir, can I, you know, more? Can I put more? Can I put more? And you drink it and he keeps filling it up and you're like, I, you know, what do I, what am I supposed to do? Can I just put my hand on it? This guy keeps filling it up again. But the idea is that when the cups are placed, it describes a luxurious setting where you don't even have to get up and serve yourself. That you are going to be served. And that's captured inside akwabun maldu'a. Like the cups are, the reservations already been made. The cups are already waiting for you. وَنَمَارِقُ masfufa And pillows laid out in rows. Pillows, rows and rows of, of cushing. By the way, if you have a lot of pillows laid out, that must mean you have a lot of guests. Right? So a lot of cups, a lot of guests. Now, by illusory reference, what Allah is saying is that Jannah is going to be, one of the joys of Jannah is going to be company. It's going to be people you actually enjoy being around. You know, وَأَقْبَلَ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ People are going to be facing each other, talking to each other, asking each other questions. Hey, my God, you made it too. I never thought. But you know, like, you know, like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> remember that? Back in the day, or whatever. <laughs> but they'll be having those fun conversations with each other, enjoying drinks and cups splashing, and then the butler guy coming and filling them up again. You know, هِلْبَانُ مُخَلَّدُونَ Wildanu Mukhalladun, those 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 young you know intern boys that are you know valet service that come and you know fill in the drinks or whatever they're gonna come and do that those 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 waiters and you're just gonna be enjoying your drinks and eating food and this this is what's the the scene of these pillows laid out everybody's chilling it's a party happening by a waterfall and faces are lit up it's just this beautiful scene and then he says wazarabiyu mabthutha and zarabi is rugs. Well, this is such a cool word, zarabi. It's actually not an Arabic word. 
زربية نسبة إلى أذربيجان بلد من بلاد فارس وبخارة فأصل زربية أذربية They actually in Arabic sometimes they would import rugs from Azerbaijan and they were known for making rugs in luxurious woodcraft and things like that so luxury items were imported you know like nowadays you think of like an expensive like I don't know Italian car or something or a German import or whatever or when you think of furniture or you think of luxury items, they're imported from some special place like Persian rugs nowadays, things like that. It's literally the Qur'an's expression for Persian rugs. <coughs> and it's, why would Allah do that? It's not like in Jannah, He's going to get stuff from Azerbaijan. That's not what He's saying. <laughs> That's not what He's saying. But what He is saying is He's capturing the imagination of the people that are there in the world right now. And He's talking to them and saying, imagine imported rugs that you've never seen before. Just the closest thing to which you can imagine is what? The stuff you get from Azerbaijan right now. That's what he's saying to them. This is actually not the only place Qur'an does that. At the end of Surah Al-Rahman, he says, وَعَبْقَرِي in hisan, In luxury items that are abqari. Abqari actually in the Arabic language is from abqar. Abqar is the ancient, they say, the mystical land of jinn. In other words, you've got this like decorative item that's so exotic. You're like, where'd you get this from? This is like from another world. And that's their way of saying was, it's abqari. I was like, it's, not, it's out of this world, never seen anything like it. You're going to see rugs like you've never seen anything like it. And that's what's being referred to. Notice here an important point of consideration. This is the last ayah of the Jannah ayat. A point of consideration here. Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to imagine what's going to happen in Jannah, but he, he uses what we experience in this life as a springboard to help us imagine it. Even though the Prophet told us, ما لا عين رأت ولا أذن سمعت وما خطر على قلب بشر No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no imagination of the heart of any person has ever encapsulated what Jannah has to offer. Still, still, Allah Azza wa Jal will actually take what experience of luxury we have in this life and build on that to give us an appreciation of what is coming in Jannah. Now we get to almost the conclusion of this surah. This is the third section of the surah. You notice the first one was judgment day, exhaustion and punishment. The second was the exception. By the way, some faces are going to be alright. They're going to do pretty good. And now we come back to the, the, what I was telling you. The only criticism, the only call to action made for these people that aren't, are refusing to listen to this warning or this visualization isn't realistic enough to them. أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Haven't they taken a good staring look at the camel? How it was created. How was the camel created? Now this, of course, is capturing the imagination of the Arab traveler. When do they have a time to stare at a camel for a long time? When they're traveling. Like they're not, just when they're doing their other business, they don't stand there and stare at a camel for a long time. But when they're traveling, there are hours, days, weeks, months go by, and all they look at is what? The camel in front of them. The one that they're riding. يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلْ And then they notice different things about the camel that otherwise you wouldn't notice. So for example, how gentle the camel is, how high its ride is, how it can survive basically not, you know, on nothing, how it gives you milk, it gives you skin, it gives you meat. In other words, this, this ship that Allah created, perfectly designed for you to be able to navigate the journey of the desert. A horse wouldn't have survived. Any other creature wouldn't have survived. And this, this creature survives. And then the, the things that Allah created inside of a camel, how rough its skin is. And even if, an, if, if the camel dies, its skin can be used to turn it into a tent. Like they can survive a sandstorm just from the skin of the, the, the camel. Its meat can help them survive for weeks on end. Then on top of all of that, its eyes, its eyelids is crazy. When, when sandstorms come, the Arabs have to cover their eyes. But the camel can't cover its eyes. It's going to keep moving, right? Allah literally created like a, like a car wiper system. It actually blocks the sand from the eyelid of the camel. It doesn't have to blink in the middle of a sandstorm. Have you noticed this? incredible mechanical design of this creature that is for your purpose. It's this, you know, it is the accumulation of his ability to know, like Allah knows exactly what this creature needs to survive in this world. Allah Azza wa knows what it requires to survive this journey. Allah is by telling, by telling you to reflect on the camel, by telling me to reflect, especially the Arab traveler to reflect on the camel, is actually teaching him humility. Look at this marvelous creature that Allah put to your service. And you refuse to put yourself in my service. You know? Look at what Allah has made for you. And by the way, the, the theme of journey, don't forget that. It is actually in the course of journey that you would stare at a camel for so long. And haven't they looked at the sky, how high it's been elevated? Again, when are they going to have time to stare at the sky? When they're traveling. 
So you've got this image of somebody riding on their camel, appreciating the things about their camel, and then they look up at this remarkable skyscape, this endless skyscape. Who put this beautiful roof over you? And then as your eye comes down from the, ca- the sky and the camel, you look far ahead and you see a, a range of mountains. You know? And so Allah says, and didn't they look at the mountains? How they've been pegged in, they've been grounded to the ground. By the way, nasibah and nusibah, it's a repeat of the same word. <coughs> Faces are going to be exhausted on that day. The, the, the um, arrogant one thinks that they're never going to experience that kind of exhaustion. And Allah by implication is teaching him, I can even exhaust the mountains. What are you? You know, I have, I have put the mountains down. I can't put you down. So, نصبت, And how he's put them down, and by the way, it's Lughatul Abdat, something put down and made prominent. That's why Nasaba Ainahu is to raise your eyes also from, from below. So, anyway, now, And didn't they look to the earth and how flat it's been laid out? Of course, nobody appreciates flat land more than the desert traveler among the Arabs. Right? So, this is actually the reality all around them captured, isn't it? They're traveling. They've got their camel, they've got the sky, they've got the mountains in the distance, and they've got the flat land that Allah has made, uh, you know, made, made normal now, made level for them. I'm reminded actually in this ayah, in these ayat, about what Allah says in Surah at takwir He there also talked about the sky being torn open. He also talked about the mountain sailing away. He also talked about the she camel walking off. It's the same items that are now repeating themselves here. As if judgment day will come and all these things will not be as they are now. But for now, they are the way they are. For now, things are normal. In other words, you still have time. You're still on a journey where you can fix things. Because a time will come where the earth will not be the way it is. It's not going to be smooth like it is now. It's not going to be calm like it is now. The sky won't be what it is right now. It's not going to be rufiat like this. The, 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 The mountains are not going to be staying in place like they are. The camel is not going to be where, you know, humble to you on that day. It's going to be left alone. All of it's going to change. And so it's almost by implication they're being told, you're on this journey, but you don't have a lot of time. Haven't you thought about the fact that just like you go on a journey from point A to point B, your entire life is actually a journey. Think about that. You, you contemplate that. So they, they're made to, to contemplate on that. Now, the, the address comes back to the Prophet wasallam, and here's where the surah concludes. Fadakir. Then if they're not going to think about it, and they're not going to contemplate, I have given them enough reasons to really be lost in thought. By the way, those of you that have traveled know, when you're traveling especially by yourself, it gives you a lot of time to think. Also sleep and play video games. But other than that, if you're not wasting your time frying your brain cells, it gives you time to think and contemplate. Right? Allah says, when, when you, I've given you that opportunity to think, you should be arriving at some conclusions yourself. Now, every human being is therefore responsible to arrive at the truth on their own. The ability to think for themselves and find direction in life is something Allah made us capable of. He made us capable of nazar. But above and beyond that is the Prophet ﷺ giving them reminder. So now the Prophet is told, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ Just remind. Your only responsibility, what, what are you if not a reminder? Meaning a, a, a person to give reminder. That's all you are. And that's all you need to do. You don't need to change anybody. If they're not going to think for themselves, if they're not going to look at reality around them for themselves, then your reminder will have no benefit and that's okay. But you, that doesn't change what you're supposed to do. You just keep on giving a reminder. You notice in the previous surah also we saw فَذَكِرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى And now you have فَذَكِرْ إِنَّ مَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ It's highlighting two different realities. There it was, it doesn't matter who listens and doesn't listen. You just remind. If the reminder itself is beneficial, you just remind. Here again, the recipient isn't specified. And Allah is saying, look, whether they benefit or not, whether they, it's on them. If they are, become people of thought, your reminder will actually become of benefit to them. So now, and here, by the way, the subject isn't specified. What should you remind them of? Should you remind them of the akhirah? Should you remind them of Allah? Should you remind them of how they were created? Should you remind them of the history of previous nations? It's all of it's open-ended. Whatever reminder you give them, if they are actually people of thought, all of it will converge and it will make sense to them. Otherwise, you can't control them. And so clearly Allah says, لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرِ You are not in charge, especially over them. You have no control over them. Saytara is actually to safeguard someone, to control someone, to have complete say over somebody. The Prophet's being told, you, you, you are not in charge. You can't tell them what to do. All you can do is give a reminder. 
إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر. This is the attitude of a da'i. We don't control people. We don't get frustrated that they don't listen. Our job is just to give a reminder as a, as a da'i. That's it. Whether people change or not, that's between them and Allah. That's between them and Allah. You know, sometimes you give a, a reminder to your family member, you tell them a hadith or something and they don't listen to you. Like, I even gave them proper dalil and they didn't listen. Uh, yeah, they didn't. Get over it. Prophets gave a lot better than you and people didn't listen to them. So chill out. You know, it becomes about our own pride more than it does about the reminder itself. Changing people is up to Allah. And actually, Allah won't change them until حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُوا مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Until they change what's inside of themselves. That's the message of the surah. If their view hasn't changed, if the way they look at reality hasn't changed, then none of these reminders will change anything inside of them. So, the Prophet is relieved of this responsibility and finally told, إِلَّا مَنْ تَوَلَّى وَكَفَرَ With the exception of the one who turned away and the one who disbelieved, فَيُعَذِّبُهُ اللَّهُ الْعَذَابَ الْأَكْبَرَ Then Allah will Himself punish him the greatest punishment. Two questions arise here. What is this exception to? One, one way of interpreting this is, you have no authority over them. Meaning the Quraysh who don't listen to you right now. But the ones who turn away in disbelief, you will eventually, in fact, will have authority over them. Makkah will be conquered. The time is coming. Just not right now. Just it's okay. Right now, no. But not only will you have authority over them, and if they still don't believe, then Allah will punish them. The ultimate punishment on top of that too. That's the first thing about the exception. The other, the other interesting note, uh, point about the exception Others say no, this is only saying that Allah will deal with them exceptionally in the akhirah, you will have no control over them. I actually prefer to think this is alluding to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is being kind of in, the, in between the lines told, you will eventually have authority over them. You know, it is coming. That saytara is coming. But still it doesn't answer the question, why are they being given the greatest of all punishment? فَيُعَذِّبُهُ اللَّهُ الْعَذَابَ akbar. Why not just punishment? Why the greatest punishment? This is to me a very important consideration. The, the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is the ultimate gift of Allah to humanity. And the people that rejected him after meeting with him, after living with him, after hearing him, after spending a life with him, they have committed a greater crime than anybody else that will ever commit a crime. People that come 300 years after that and don't believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa still criminal. But nowhere near the people who lived with him, were family with him, knew him, and still rejected him. The ones who turned their back on him and disbelieved in him, despite there are two things that happened. The greatest word of Allah was given, and it was given to the greatest example ever given to humanity. The greatest opportunity to accept the truth was presented to them, not just in theory, but in practice, in front of their eyes. When they rejected that and became enemies against the Prophet ﷺ, there is no greater crime than that. So you have to understand, when Allah says the greatest punishment, he's, I would, I'm convinced here that Allah is not describing everybody in humanity who ever turns away. They may have punishment, but Al-Adhab Al-Akbar is actually a reference to, you are giving a reminder, Rasulullah, you're not in charge over them, but the ones who still turn away even after you become, after, and, and remain your enemies, those are the people that deserve the greatest punishment. This makes you sensitive to how Allah talks about punishment in the Qur'an. Every time Allah is talking about punishment, He's not talking about your non-Muslim neighbor. Or just anybody. It's specific to a specific case. You have to be careful how you pass verdict on what is it that Allah is referring to subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, فَيُعَذِّبُهُ اللَّهُ الْعَذَابَ الْأَكْبَرِ By the way, عَذْب, interestingly enough, عَذْب in Arabic means dehydration also. And it goes back to the idea that they're going, they're scorching and they're trying to get back and, you know, then the boiling, boiling water is thrown on top of them or they're, they're thrown in that spring again. So now the, the concluding statement of Allah in the surah, inna ilayna iyabahum. There's no doubt about it. It is only to ourselves that they are going to be coming back. Aba ya'ubu means to come back humbly, to come back hum- with humility. They are going to be humbled and they're going to be coming back to us. And there's nowhere else that they can go. No doubt about it. Inna ilayna iyabahum. Let them go wherever they want. Let them make fun of what you're saying. Let them dismiss you. Let them become your enemy. It's okay. Eventually they're coming and there's nowhere, nowhere else that they can go. ثُمَّ inna alayna hisabahum. And there, moreover, it is only us that has taken the responsibility of auditing them. Holding them to account for everything that they've done. Not only will they be coming back to us with humility, we're the only ones that are going to be passing judgment over them. We're the only ones that are going to be holding them to account. This is the idea of, you know, what's previously mentioned, أَمَّا مَنْ أُوتِيَ كِتَابَهُ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ 
you know, and Hisab and Yasir on the other side, and you know, the idea of Hisab that they're going to be, uh, you know, audited before Allah Azza wa Now, as I tap, wrap all of this up, I want to show you what happened inside of the surah organizationally. Basically, this surah can be divided into three parts. The first part, the Prophet Sallallahu is told, hasn't the news come to you of that which will overwhelm? al ghashiyah And notice, by the way, at the end, the Prophet is addressed directly again. You're just there to remind. So the way it begins is the way it ends. It talked to the Prophet directly in the beginning. It talks to the Prophet directly at the end. When the Prophet was told in the beginning, he was told it's going to be something that overwhelms. That there is no escape from. Remember I told you that? There's no escape from it. And by the end, Allah reinforces that idea and says, you can only come back to me. And only I will be doing your audit. There is no escape from it. Then also, pre previously in the beginning, Allah said that their faces are going to be humbled, if you remember. Khashia. And iyab, inna ilayna iyabahum, is to come back with humility, with khushur. It's embedded inside of the meaning. So the warning... So the, the, the Prophet ﷺ, look, you've been told, you keep on reminding is in the beginning, and you've been told, you keep on reminding is at the end. They are going to face this punishment is in the beginning, they're going to face that punishment is at the end. That's the opening and closing of this surah. The opening additionally gave us some extra relief. What's the extra relief that Allah gave us directly? The extra relief was, by the way, some faces are going to have a really good time. That's what He, he gave us. At the end, he didn't openly say that again. He simply said, your job is just there to, your job is just to remind, as if to say some people will benefit from that reminder and their faces are going to be lit up. Don't worry about it. Okay? That leaves us with the heart of the surah, the middle of the surah. And that's actually, afala yanzurun. Why don't they look at, have they taken a good look at the camel? Have they look, uh, taken a good look at the, at the mountain, the sky, the earth? And by the way, each of those things requires its own contemplation. Each of them makes you feel a different... Like the camel may make you feel grateful for what Allah has created for you. The mountain may make you feel humble. The sky may make you feel always under watch because the sky is always over you. You know, each The earth may make you feel you're going to be under it. Your, event, your, your temporal nature. These are all essential lessons for guidance. For anybody who's going to travel in this life, Allah has said, if you contemplate on life around you, then you will be well equipped and well prepared to deal with the life that is coming. And that's what in the, in the heart of the surah. In other words, the reminder of the Prophet ﷺ will not be of benefit until people become a people of thought themselves. If that middle isn't there, then the, what surrounds it will not be of benefit. May Allah Azza wa Jal truly make us a people of thought, and may Allah Azza wa Jal soften the hearts of humanity towards His deen. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat